and hopelessness stuck in this mud of sin got no strength to even try to stand Good afternoon once again, brothers and sisters. Uh, I'm happy that you could keep me company. Uh, we're going to have our table talk once again today. And if you have some questions in your mind, particularly about uh, the subject matter that we have, uh, we'd like you to post it uh, on the chat line. And we'll try and read them and see if we can answer uh, some of those questions. We would like you, however, to limit your questions uh, to this subject matter on eschatology because uh, we don't want to be going into other matters 
when we are talking about the doctrine of the last days. And so once again, thank you so much for keeping me company. And uh, I'd, I'd like to give a shout out to some people who are watching us right now. I'd like to welcome in our midst, uh, Yang Yang and Jet, uh, Marlene uh, from Hong Kong, Jojo and John of our worship team, uh, Zenaida from Cagayan de Oro. I'd also like to welcome Sister Tessie Gamboa, Agafe, Iris, Estela Colantes, Aitis uh, Sinches, Dalin Cortel, uh, Mini Yaun, uh, praise the Lord, Maria Fe from Sambuan, Cebu, thank you for tuning in. Lydia Reyes once again, uh, Pastor June Garces of Hong Kong, I'd like to greet you once again. Uh, Evie and Winith Batuhan of our church in Surigao. Winith is our pastor there in Surigao City. Praise the Lord. I'd like to greet Jory. Uh, also, uh, Ruel Karm Tampos, one of our pastors. Uh, Living Word uh, Danao also is watching us. Praise the Lord. Uh, Erna Arezalita, welcome to our program. Uh, Julie Guatno. Uh, Fray Jessamonte once again from our church in the United Kingdom. Lorna Woods uh, greets us a good afternoon from the United Kingdom as well. Chris Henry Abalie from Mandawe. Uh, Sonia C. Charmata from uh, Laguna. Also, we'd like to welcome Jackie De La Serna from Masbate, Ermi, and then also LG Gloria from uh, Forest Hills. Well, just... Uh, Right beside us, our neighbor here, Lin Shaib, uh, Lin Laya, Talisay, Jennifer Oitiepo, uh, Grace Tura, praise the Lord, Sandy Noel, welcome, Roland de la Serna, our pastor in Masbate, uh, my brother Jess, uh, maybe my brother Joe is watching, shout out to my family there together with uh, my niece, Laika, and also my mom, uh, Mommy Tess, uh, I love you. Uh, Estela Pamaong from uh, Royal Christian Church in Bohol. Maria Kataag, thank you for tuning in. Edna, uh, Farah, Senaida, Johanna. Also, Lucille, Mami Lulu, my mother-in-law, together with Loli. How are you? Uh, Marie sends her love to you. Presi, our pastor in uh, Molave. Merli from Laguna also. Emmy Antipala, praise God, Jojo Santiago, Heidi Fillard uh, from Ilocos, Debbie, Cecil Totting, Teresa, uh, uh, Nenita, Senaida Yu, Juan Carlos Torres uh, from High Iraq, hi, how are you? Uh, please greet Wendy, uh, good afternoon, please. Also, we'd like to welcome uh, Michael Chua, who's watching right now. Uh, Michael, how are you? Good that you could tune in. Also, Sister Jeannie Marte uh, from CCF Manila. Thank you, Sister Jeannie, for watching us. Kindly um, greet uh, Brother Zal. A good afternoon, please. Lani, also Belia, Virgie, Rona. Uh, praise the Lord. Donnie, our pastor. Uh, also, we have Mila Blanca from the United States. James from Lapu-Lapu. Carolyn Amor, and also Bruce Frank. Hi, Bruce. Uh, it's been a while since uh, we've seen each other. I hope you're doing fine there in your home. Please greet your wife as well. A good afternoon. Brother Jingle, Ran, Senji, Marie Field from uh, Malaysia. Manong, uh, could you please greet uh, Sister Baby? A good afternoon, please, as well as your dad. Uh, Sister Bubut uh, Aquino. In uh, Butuan, praise the Lord. Uh, Charlene Yu from Tisa. Giovanni Almosan. Uh, Sister Luna Pagalan, how are you? Anna B. Gonzalez. Uh, Gabales, I'm sorry, from uh, Mindanao, Bukidnon. Anna May Godwin from uh, Bacolod. Al Solis, our coach. Uh, praise the Lord. Fekihano. Dailinda from Bulacan. Brixi. Oji Karen. Florky Salve. And also my, uh, my niece, Pia Velarde Besmonte. How are you there, Chick Chick? Uh, she has a uh, talk show, a TV talk show. She does some cooking. Uh, and so maybe if you have the time, you can also watch uh, her and she can give you some 
nice recipe. So once again, uh, thank you for tuning in. It's a lovely uh, Sunday, I'm sorry, not Sunday, but Wednesday afternoon. And uh, we just had rain, so it's quite cool right now. So, uh, <coughs> excuse me. Um, I'd like you to join me in a short word of prayer. Could you please uh, bow your heads in prayer with me? Thank you, Lord. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for this blessed afternoon you've given us, O oh God, to uh, be able to study your word. And I pray for your Holy Spirit to be upon me. And Father, upon your people, give us understanding. But we pray that our knowledge that we will gain from today will not be merely intellectual and that this will not be a mere academic exercise. Lord, we pray that you might cause our hearts to be in awe of you, in awe of your greatness and power. And we pray, Father, that you might somehow inspire us, give us faith, most especially when it comes to your word, O oh God. And if there are people who are out there who do not know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, we pray, Father, that they might come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Well, right now we're going to have a look at Revelation chapter 11 all the way to uh, verse 14. So uh, uh, this is still part, I believe, of uh, uh, the sixth trumpet. And so uh, these are things that we can expect that will take place in the future. So allow me to just read um, verse 1, first of all, and then we'll just go verse by verse. Uh, try to give you the sense of what uh, this passage means for us. Uh, let's have a look at verse 1. It says, Then there was given me a measuring rod like a staff, and someone said, Get up and measure the temple of God and the altar and those who worship in it. Now, one of the things that I'd like to highlight here for you is the word temple because as you and I very well know in 70 AD the uh, the the temple was destroyed by uh, Titus with his Roman armies and so from 70 AD all the way to up to today there is still no temple in Israel now having said that however uh, the people of Israel do have ambitions of rebuilding uh, the third temple. The first temple, of course, was the temple that was made by Solomon, which was destroyed uh, when uh, the Babylonians came in. They invaded Israel. They destroyed the temple. And so later on, after 70 years, uh, Cyrus uh, from the Persian Empire allowed them to rebuild the temple so there was a second temple that was rebuilt under the leadership of Zerubbabel and so that was built and then later on renovated by uh, King Herod however uh, in 70 AD as I mentioned to you that temple was destroyed now we find here that in the book of Revelation, in the tribulation period, we find the presence of the temple, which means to say that a third temple will be built. Now, of course, uh, this seems to be very difficult to imagine right now. Why? Because in that place right now is what is called as the Dome of the Rock. It is a Muslim edifice and considered as the second most important uh, religious place after Mecca. And so the big question is, how will the people of Israel be able to rebuild the temple? And again, uh, we don't know how it's going to happen, but the scriptures do tell us that there will, there will be a third temple. By the way, uh, Revelation chapter 11 is not only the place where you find a rebuilt uh, temple, you will also find it in Thessalonians, which I will show to you 
uh, later on. And so this is part of biblical prophecy. This is a prediction about future things that will take place. The third temple will be built. Now, what should be the rationale why Israel would want to rebuild the temple? Well, in the first place, we have to understand that in the Old Testament, there was no worship, there was no real worship, and no atoning sacrifice without the temple. The temple was such a very important building uh, for the people of Israel because it was there that the burnt offerings were made, the sin offerings, and all the sacrifices. It was there that the Day of Atonement uh, was practiced by the high priest. And so, there is no real worship apart from the temple if you're talking about the Old Testament. Now, here's the thing. You and I know that majority of the Jews, except for a remnant of Jews, believed that Jesus Christ was not the Messiah. And therefore, since He is not the Messiah, for them, it is still essential for them to continue with their temple sacrifices to provide atonement for their sins. So this uh, gives them the impetus and the motivation to rebuild the temple. Uh, not only that, in days uh, past, we're talking about the Old Testament, the people of Israel thought that for as long as they had the temple, Israel was impregnable. So this was part of their uh, belief that the temple provided safety for them. So this would be an additional motivation for them to rebuild the temple. Now also, another very important thing and fact which I'd like to share to you is that in our visits to Israel, uh, we have visited the Temple Institute. And in the Temple Institute, you will find that practically all the, uh, all the fixtures that are needed inside uh, the Holy of Holies as well as in the Most Holy Place are there except, of course, for um, the uh, Ark of the Covenant. That is the only missing piece that we have. But you have the lampstand there. Uh, you have the showbread, you have the altar of incense, you have the bronze altar. Uh, the, the, the clothing of the priests are already there. And uh, we were told that uh, the priests, uh, the Levites, are being trained so that just in case they would be able to rebuild the temple, they would be prepared. Now also the red heifer, uh, which is also a very important part in their uh, animal sacrifices is also being prepared uh, according to the Temple Institute they have a farm wherein they are raising up this red heifer and so preparations are being done to rebuild the temple and so again uh, we are confident that because we believe in biblical prophecy this will happen how it will happen we do not know, most especially because of the presence of the Dome of the Rock. It might interest you that Anna Ra Ravens, who is a Jew, left a legacy of $50,000 several years ago to be used in the rebuilding of the temple in Jerusalem. And many other Jews have shared in that dream and they have contributed uh, a lot of money to be able to uh, rebuild the temple. By the way, they already have the lampstand there, the golden lampstand, which cost them uh, at least a million dollars because it's, uh, it's made of uh, pure gold. And it's already in place. Uh, it's in display uh, near uh, the Temple Institute. Uh, it can be seen by passers-by. Uh, passers uh, it can be seen by tourists and so everything is practically in place so the only one big problem right now is the presence of the dome 
of the rock. Now, as I mentioned to you, it is not only in the book of Revelation that we find the presence of the third temple. Paul himself prophesies about the third temple. And where do you find that? I'd like you to please open your Bibles to 2 Thessalonians. Uh, kindly have a look at 2 Thessalonians right now. And we'll have a look at chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. So kindly open your Bibles, please. All right. Now, watch what uh, Paul is saying here in 2 Thessalonians. It says in verse 3, Let no one in any way deceive you, for it will not come unless... The apostasy comes first. Uh, the word apostasy means departure. And in my understanding uh, of Scripture, I think uh, one possibility is that this refers to the rapture. All right? Because, again, uh, it could be translated merely or plainly as departure. And then it says... Um, it will not come unless the departure comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed. Now, who is this man of lawlessness? Well, clearly, this is in reference to the Antichrist, whom we would be introduced shortly in the succeeding chapters in the book of Revelation. So, uh, he will appear in the scene. He's called also the son of destruction. And then it says, who opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, displaying himself as being God. So, again, very clearly, the Bible speaks. Paul, a while ago when we talked about Revelation, of course, this was the writing of John the Beloved, and John the Beloved testifies that there will be a third temple. And now we are having a look at Second Thessalonians. Um, and the author of this book, of course, is none other than Paul. And Paul himself likewise states that there will be a third temple. Now, obviously, what is going to happen is that the Antichrist initially would allow the rebuilding of the temple. And also, if you recall one of our previous studies, we said that Antichrist does not just mean against Christ. It can also mean in place of Christ. And so this person will actually present himself as the Messiah of Israel. And initially, a lot of people, a lot of the Jews, would receive him as their own Messiah. And... Of course, we know that uh, there will still be a great number of Jews uh, who would reject uh, the Antichrist. Uh, but initially, they would probably think this might be the Messiah. And so the first thing that he would do is he would allow uh, the third temple to be rebuilt once again. There will be um, religious toleration. But then again, notice what will happen in the middle of the tribulation period. We are told here that he will take his seat in the temple of God. He will now desecrate this temple by entering this place and allowing himself to be an object of worship. Now, there, there are more details which I would like to present to you later on. And so I don't want to preempt myself because uh, it's a subject in our future study. So hopefully um, this has been quite helpful to you, uh, for you to understand that there's going to be a third temple. So we go back once again to uh, Revelation. Could you please uh, go back to Revelation chapter 11? And so let's read again. It says, There was given me a measuring rod like a staff. Now, what is a measuring rod used for? Well, 
Uh, sometimes a measuring rod was used for measuring your property. So it was used to measure uh, property, meaning to say uh, this speaks about ownership. And what, what the Bible is saying here, and let's read through once again verse 1. It says, Then there was given me a measuring rod like a staff, and someone said, Get up and measure the temple of God and the altar and those who worship in it. So what we are seeing here is that what God is saying is that, that this temple uh, belongs to him. This temple belongs to the Jews. And not only that, it says, and those who worship in it. Now, this might be referring to the godly remnant um, who worship in that place and who probably in the future would be part of God's elect. Uh, they would come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Remember, I mentioned to you, there would be one-third of the Jewish population that would receive Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. One-third of them, and there will be 144,000 Jewish evangelists. All right? So, again, uh, basically that is what uh, this passage means. And then we go to verse 2. And um, what does verse 2 say? It says, leave out the court which is outside the temple and do not measure it for it has been given to the nations and they will tread underfoot the holy city for 42 months. So what is going to happen here and maybe um, let's first uh, deal with this phrase, leave out the court. Uh, why is it that the Bible says leave out the court? Because this will be under Gentile control. So right now, we know that the Jews have been planted in their own land, uh, in the land of promise, in the land of Israel. Uh, they will never be removed from that place. But it doesn't mean that they will not encounter any conflicts nor any trouble most especially during the tribulation period. Because what this verse is saying is that the nations will tread underfoot the holy city, and that is in reference, the holy city here is Jerusalem for 42 months. So meaning to say that for a period of three and a half years, because that's the equivalent of 42 months, for a period of three and a half years. And most probably this is talking about the latter three and a half years of the seven year tribulation period. And during that time, they would be invaded once again and Gentiles, nations would thread upon that city again for three and a half years. So it is only for a short period of time. So they will somehow lose possession again of Jerusalem, at least total possession, because they would be invaded. And they will be in a state of, once again, subjugation. Uh, again, as I mentioned to you, this, however, will still be a very short period of time. We're talking about three and a half years. Now, we are going to be introduced to two very important people. It says in verse 3, and could you please go to verse 3 at this time? It says, And I will grant authority to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy for 1260 days clothed in sackcloth. Now, 1260 days or 1260 days is also three and a half years. Now, in all probability, this seems to fit within the first half, all right? The, the, the first half of the tribulation period. The, 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 the coming of the Antichrist to desecrate the temple would be in the last three and a half years. But in the first three and a half years, it's possible that this would be the placement of these two witnesses. And they are prophets because we are told here that they would prophesy 
for 1260 days clothed in sackcloth. Now, there are two aspects to uh, prophesying. One aspect of uh, prophesying is foretelling, which is simply the proclamation of God's word. And then the other one would be uh, foretelling, in which case it becomes predictive. Now, obviously, in all probability, these two witnesses will be performing the proclaiming and the predicting aspect of prophecy. And they would be wearing uh, sackcloth. And sackcloth, of course, is, um, is a symbol of one's afflicted condition regarding the spiritual desolation that was surrounding them. So it was a sort of uh, uh, symbolism of the afflicted condition regarding the spiritual desolation surrounding them. Now, there have been many speculations as to who these two witnesses are, and I'd like to present those uh, speculations or those educated uh, guesses coming from Bible scholars. Uh, one view is that these two witnesses might be referring to Moses and Elijah because of the similarity of the Old Testament miracles, uh, as you will find it here in verses 5 and 6, which, which I will read to you uh, later on. So again, uh, many similarities to the miracles that Elijah and Moses performed. And likewise, uh, they appeared uh, before the Lord uh, in the transfiguration, if you recall. Moses and Elijah... Uh, came before the Lord in the transfiguration. Moses representing the law and Elijah representing the prophets. So this convinces some uh, Bible scholars that this might be referring to Moses and Elijah. And of course, uh, some of these Bible scholars also use Malachi chapter 4 verse 5 when it speaks of the coming of Elijah before the day of the Lord. Now, we have a problem with this, most especially in the case of Moses, because Moses already died once. And as you will find out later on in this chapter, uh, these two witnesses would die. So how could Moses die twice? All right? So that would be a problem. Of course, in the case of Elijah, you and I know that he did not die. He was raptured. But again... We would, we would believe that he, uh, his body was changed from mortality into immortality. Uh, we cannot assume that uh, when he entered heaven, he still entered heaven, heaven in his own earthly flesh and blood. As the Bible says in 1 Corinthians, um, that flesh and blood cannot, our flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. In other words, we have to die first before we get to be in heaven. So there are many problems with this position. Now another uh, position would be this might be referring to Enoch and Elijah because both of them were raptured. All right, They were both translated. Now again, you might have a problem here. Why? Because Enoch is not a Jew. All right, Enoch is a Gentile. So, again, that would be a problem uh, in this case. And then some uh, propose that it might be Elijah and John the Baptist. Now, your problem with John the Baptist is he also died once. So, uh, what can we say? Well, the only thing I can say in terms of uh, coming up with my own personal stand is I don't think it represents Moses and Elijah nor Enoch and Elijah, nor Elijah and John the Baptist. My stand is that this is referring to two uh, prophets, two witnesses that will be raised up by God in the tribulation period. And they would be mighty uh, mouthpieces, mighty proclaimers of God's word in the tribulation period. And so I believe that that would be the best position to take and uh, there seems to be no problems uh, with that, all right? 
So God gives, uh, one of the things you notice here is that God gives his most powerful witnesses in the darkest hours of uh, our history. That happened in the case of Elijah, and Elijah, of course, in the darkest uh, period of the northern kingdom of Israel, there was much apostasy. They were worshiping Baal, and of course, uh, under the leadership of Ahab and Jezebel. And it was during that time that God raised up mighty prophets in the person of Elijah and Elisha. So it is not uncommon to find that in the darkest hours of history, he somehow raises up his greatest uh, prophets. And in this particular case, in the tribulation period, we find that he does the same. He raises up two mighty prophets. Now, it says here that they are the two olive trees and the two lampstands that stand before the Lord of the earth. Now, uh, these phrases, olive trees and lampstands, or two lampstands, are in fact quite familiar if you study the Old Testament because in the Old Testament you will find it in Zechariah chapter 4 and also in uh, verse 3 and verse 14 of the same chapter. And we find that the two olive trees represented there would be Joshua, who was the high priest, and Zerubbabel, who happened to be the governor. Now, we are not suggesting, of course, that this might be a resurrection of Joshua, the high priest, and, and Zerubbabel. However, we, we somehow believe that the point of this passage is that the same empowering that was given to Zerubbabel and Joshua the high priest, the same empowering of the Holy Spirit will be upon these two prophets. So this speaks about a great empowering of the Holy Spirit. And of course, lampstands represent giving out a witness. So just like... Uh, their Old Testament counterparts, they would be empowered by the Holy Spirit and they would be used by God as mighty witnesses for the glory of God. Now, we will notice in verses 5 and 6 the miracles that they will perform and I will read it in a bit. All right, so let me just read verses 5 and 6. And it says here, And if anyone wants to harm them, obviously there will be persecution against them, fire flows out of their mouth and devours their enemies. This is very similar to Elijah. And then um, it says, So if anyone wants to harm them, he must be killed in this way. So again, as I mentioned to you, this is very similar to what happened to Elijah when he was being fetched by soldiers uh, coming from uh, the king of uh, Israel at that time. Now, it says here, these have the power to shut up the sky so that rain will not fall during the days of their prophesying. So rain would not fall. And again, we are reminded of what Elijah uh, was able to do, the authority that God gave to him to shut the sky from raining. And, and that is why some Bible scholars believe that this might be Elijah. And I already made the point that in all probability, this is not Elijah. And then it says um, here, that they have the power over the waters to turn them into blood. Now, what are you reminded of? Well, you're reminded of uh, Moses in this case, who turned the Nile River, the, the water in the Nile River, into blood. All right. So, again, very similar to what Moses did, and to strike the earth with every plague as often as they desire. So, the plagues here, once again, remind you of the miracles that were performed by uh, Moses. 
Now let me just go to a sidebar and uh, I think it's very important to discuss this. This is one of the reasons why I personally do not believe that miracles have ceased because as you will see in our study and here you already see it in the book of Revelation in the tribulation period you find that miracles signs and wonders are still very much in place and God is using these two prophets to perform many miracles and then if you do a study of the millennium you will find that um, miracles would still be in place during the millennium and if you also have a look at Joel chapter 2 when it prophesies about the day of the Lord it is talking about the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in the tribulation period as well as in the millennium so my thinking is this and this is just one of many reasons why I believe that miracles are still for today when you have a look at the Old Testament, you see miracles in place. I mean, all throughout the history of Israel, you find that miracles were in place. You find it in the case of Moses. Uh, you find it in the case of uh, Elijah, in the case of Samuel, in the case of um, even Samson, who had supernatural strength. You had Elisha. And, and many other prophets, they were performing many signs, wonders, and miracles. And so that was seen in the Old Testament. And then we go to the New Testament. Of course, we have the example of Jesus Christ performing many miracles. Of course, the argument might be, well, he is the Son of God. And obviously, he was trying to prove that he was the Messiah. Of course, uh, that is granted. But then you will find that the apostles performed miracles and then the early church as well uh, performed many signs, miracles, and wonders as well. And, and so if you, if you do a study of, of history, the Old Testament, there are miracles. Uh, in the gospel, there are miracles. And then in the early church, as we find it in the book of Acts, there are miracles. And then you segue into the tribulation period. You have signs, wonders, and miracles. And then you segue further into the millennium. You still have signs, wonders, and miracles. And so my big question is, why should, be, why should the latter part of the church in our dispensation not have miracles, wherein miracles are part of the reality menu of God um, in all dispensations, in all time periods, there are miracles being performed by God. So it doesn't really make sense to me that in our present dispensation, miracles would not be taking place. It is like uh, tying the hands of God and saying, God, you cannot do any miracle signs and wonders today. And my big question is, why should we tie the hands of God to be able to perform signs, miracles, and wonders? Now, it is true that there are seasons wherein there seems to be a scarcity of signs, wonders, and miracles. And we do have an example, in fact, between the Old Testament and the Gospels. Because when we go to... Um, uh, what happened in the period between the Old Testament and the Gospels, you have uh, hundreds of years of prophetic silence. Hundreds of years of prophetic silence. But was it, was it uh, saying that God could no longer perform uh, uh, miracles? Was it saying that God would no longer uh, perform prophecy? No, it is merely saying that God, the silence of God in what is called as the intertestament period was as a result of the stubbornness of the nation of Israel. God had spoken through the prophets Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, 
and even the minor prophets in Israel did not pay attention, did not listen. And so God was silent for hundreds of years. And then he was ready to speak again in the Gospels. So anyway, that is just a sidebar. It is not um, a complete, um, I would say, a complete uh, polemic uh, against those who do, do, do not believe in signs, wonders, and miracles for today. Now, having said that, I somehow uh, understand the reason why some uh, Bible scholars and some pastors no longer believe in signs, wonders, and miracles. And it is because there are some uh, Pentecostals and some Charismatics who have caused so much disrepute uh, to the church. And there are many practices that are in excess of what the Bible says. And these excesses have brought the church into great disrepute. And I would tend to agree that sometimes some of the so-called miracles are not really from God. They might even be demonic. So um, again, just to be fair, I think that's the reason why some people uh, do not believe in miracles for today. But then again, as I mentioned to you, if you survey the whole Bible, miracles have always been in place. Old Testament, Gospels, the book of Acts, and then now in the tribulation period, and then also in the millennium. God is God, and if He wants to perform a miracle, He will perform a miracle. If He wants to perform healing, He will perform healing. Now, that is not to say that God will not use natural means. We believe that in the providence of God, He can use uh, natural means. But then again, we should never ever say that God can never ever move in a supernatural way today. When you do that, when you say that, you're putting God in a box, in your own theological box, and you are, you are trying to tie the hands of God, but the hands of God cannot be tied down. God will still perform His miracles. So anyway, uh, sorry for that long sidebar, but I just felt that I needed to make that point because here we see these two witnesses performing signs, wonders, and miracles of the quality and of the caliber of Elijah and Moses. I mean, this is not just the healing of uh, sinusitis or the healing of migraine headaches. We're talking about stupendous miracles of the quality of Elijah and Moses. Now, obviously, these two very powerful uh, witnesses would be a threat to the rulership of the Antichrist. And the fact that nobody could harm them means to say that they were invincible until, until their mission was accomplished. All right? So nobody could kill them, nobody could harm them until their mission was um, finished. All right? So um, let's continue. Let's go to verse 7 right now. It says, when they have finished their testimony, meaning to say their mission was finally accomplished, the beast, referring to the Antichrist, that comes up out of the abyss will make war with them. It's quite interesting that the word war is used here in this particular case, signifying that these two mighty prophets were a very mighty threat to the Antichrist, a mighty threat to his rulership, a mighty threat to his reign. And that is why the word war is used here. And then it says, uh, we'll make war with them and overcome them. And it says, kill them. So these two very powerful witnesses probably operating 
in the first three and a half years would then be killed. They would then be killed by the Antichrist himself. And then verse 8 reads, And their dead bodies will be in the street of the great city. The great city, of course, is in reference to Jerusalem. Remember that uh, this is what we found in verse 2. So this is Jerusalem. And their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city, which mystically is called Sodom and Egypt, where also their Lord was crucified. Now, it's interesting that the holy city, that's how we call Jerusalem normally, is now called Sodom in Egypt, which basically speaks of the spiritual state uh, of Jerusalem at that time. Sodom, of course, was known for its perversion. And Egypt, of course, was known for its apostasy and rejection of God. And basically, these would be the characteristics of the people, of the Jews of that time, in this, in this city, in Jerusalem. There would be much uh, wickedness, there would be much apostasy and rejection, uh, rejection of God. And so, um, this would be what you can expect uh, will be the spiritual state of the city at that time. And so, these two very powerful witnesses, all right, uh, their bodies will be allowed to lie in the streets. They would not be given a proper burial. They would be made to lie in the streets. And then here's something very interesting in verse 9. It says, Those from the peoples and tribes and tongues and nations will look at their dead bodies for three and a half days and will not permit their dead bodies to be laid in a tomb. Now, let me ask you this question. During the time of John the Beloved, or maybe let's just talk about, uh, let's just say more than 300 years ago, or even just 200 years ago, was it possible for people's tribes, tongues, and nations to witness these dead bodies, to witness these dead bodies lying in the streets? Would it be physically possible? And the answer, of course, is no. It is not possible to witness the dead bodies lying on the street for the whole world to be able to see. Now, here's my question. Now, with the introduction of uh, satellite TV, with the introduction of the internet, with the introduction of live streaming, is it possible to witness an event worldwide? Is it possible to witness an event worldwide? And the answer to that question is yes. It is now possible at this particular juncture. So, what's my point? My point simply is that the tribulation period, at least this portion of what we find here, could not have happened 200 years ago or maybe about 100 years ago. This could not happen. This could not be witnessed by the entire world. But as I mentioned to you, with the introduction of satellite TD, and with the introduction of the internet, now it is possible to witness an event, a historical event, by all the nations of the world. You just have to watch Fox News. You just have to watch CNN. You just have to watch Al Jazeera. And actually, you can just watch things from social media, from Facebook. And the whole world can witness to a particular event. So what's my point? My point simply is that it is pretty obvious that we are really drawing nearer and nearer and nearer to the time of the rapture 
in the time of the tribulation period. Now, will I give a date? No way. <laughs> because the Bible does not give us a specific date and a specific time when this will happen. I'm just saying, you read the scriptures and you find that there are certain verses of scripture that now make plain sense. In other words, they, they can make sense in our day and in our time because of the presence of certain things that uh, we are able to witness. Like, for example, uh, technology. Technology has become far advanced. And so now it is really possible that these things could be witnessed. And so the whole world. So just try to imagine all the the powerful news network cnn fox news al jazeera maybe even um, some of the uh, local networks will be tuning into this event and they will see these two bodies and for several days they will not be allowed to be buried and so the whole world is watching that now let's find out what would be the response of the world to this event would they be horrified well here's what happens verse 10 it says and those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them and celebrate and they will send gifts to one another because these two prophets tormented those who dwell on the earth what we are going to experience, what the world is going to experience in the tribulation period in this particular event is a Christmas-like celebration. And why do I say it's a Christmas-like celebration? Because it says they will rejoice over them and celebrate and they will send gifts to one another. They will send gifts to one another. So this is going to be a Christmas-like celebration. And why do you think that is going to happen? Because according to the scriptures, these two prophets will torment them. So in what way will they, will, will they be tormented? They will be tormented because of the signs, wonders, miracles, the plagues that these uh, prophets would be able to perform. The, the rain would not come. And so there would be, um, there would be uh, the, the El Nino uh, effect upon agriculture and so because of these things the world will rejoice because of their death what is rather unfortunate however is that because they are witnesses they are prophets they are mouthpieces of God obviously their call to the world is a call to repentance it is a call for them to accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of their lives. It is a call for the people to repent, to ask for forgiveness, and to embrace the gospel. Yet sadly, majority of people in the world, as we still find in our world today, would reject the Lord Jesus Christ. And again, as we reflect on this pandemic crisis, which is really taking a toll on the emotions of a lot of people. It's taking a toll on um, the mental uh, stability of some people. Uh, it is taking a toll on the economy. Uh, it is taking a toll on uh, even the politics of this world. And, and so I wonder how people are responding. Uh, people are experiencing so much oppression and a lot of us are under duress uh, financially, emotionally, spiritually. And my question is, what is our response? Most especially, what is our response to God? Because if in the sovereignty of God, He has allowed this pandemic crisis to take place, how are we responding? Obviously, for me, if you ask me the question, the Lord is sending out a clarion call for people, first of all, to realize the fragility of their lives. Number two, to realize that 
life is so short here on earth and that people have to be thinking not only of their earthly lives, which is very short, but they should be thinking about eternity. And obviously, when you think about those two things, you should also be thinking about repentance. You should also be thinking about your relationship with the Lord. You should be thinking about uh, what should I be doing in response to what God has permitted in this world right now. And I just hope people are being sensitive to the, the dealings of God. I just hope that people are, are just being sensitive to what God is, is speaking. As, as C.S. Lewis said, pain is, is God's microphone. And this is God shouting from the housetops, trying to grab our attention. And I'm just hoping that people are listening. I'm just hoping that people are responding. I just hope that the response of people nowadays would not be the same response as we find here, wherein people were rejoicing in the death of two mighty prophets because these prophets were tormenting them. And the only reason they were being tormented was they were continually rejecting the message of repentance. They were continually rejecting the message that Jesus Christ is coming and that is why they were rejoicing but you know something very interesting is going to take place as we have a look at verse um, 11 so let's have a look at verse 11 Verse 11 reads, But after three and a half days, listen up, the breath of life from God came into them, and they stood on their feet, and great fear fell upon those who were watching them. Now remember, all of this is being watched by all the international news networks, all right? Everybody is training their sights on these two dead bodies. The whole world is rejoicing. It's, it's a Christmas-like celebration. And so they're seeing these two lifeless bodies. But then, all of a sudden, God performs a resurrection miracle. After three and a half days... They will rise from the dead. Now, now, just try to imagine this on TV. Just try to imagine this being viewed by millions of viewers over CNN, over Fox News, over Al Jazeera, seeing these two dead people rising back to life. Oh, it's going to be a real shocker. It's going to shake the whole world. This is going to be a mind-blowing event. Nothing of this sort has, has ever happened in more recent history. And then all of a sudden, right before your very eyes, as you're tuning in on TV, you will see these two dead bodies resurrected back to life. And this will be replayed over and over and over again. This will be on Facebook. This will be on international news. The whole world is going to witness this stupendous event. And so it says, uh, They stood on their feet and great fear fell upon those who were watching them. And in verse 12 it says, And they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them come up here then they went up into heaven in the cloud and their enemies watched them now just try to imagine the scenario these two previously dead people are resurrected back to life the cameras are trained on them the whole world is shocked that they rise back to life <coughs> <coughs> But not only that, they, they have an ascension. 
they have an experience of ascension very similar to what happened to the Lord Jesus Christ when he ascended on high. These two prophets are going to ascend on high and just try to imagine the cameras are trained on them and the cameras are, are panning up seeing the, the, the witness of these two very powerful prophets rising, rising until a cloud receives them. Wow! That is a mind blowing event and i tell you it's going to capture the the imagination of the entire world and the whole world is going to be watching and then look at verse 13. <coughs> It says, And in that hour, there was a great earthquake, and a tenth of the city fell. Seven thousand people were killed in the earthquake, and the rest were terrified and gave glory to the God of heaven, it says. So in that hour, right after the ascension, now comes a very powerful earthquake. Again, just try to imagine all the international news are trained on this event. They witness the resurrection. They witness the ascension. And as the reporters are reporting about this stupendous event, greatly surprised, greatly shocked, you know, very animated perhaps, all of a sudden, there's this earthquake and the cameras are shaking, the buildings are shaking, everything else is shaking, and it's a very powerful earthquake. Why do we say it's a very powerful earthquake? Because we are told 7,000 people will die in that city. Just try to imagine the power of that earthquake. Now that could be, I don't know, magnitude 9, magnitude 10, I don't know. But most definitely, it's going to be a very powerful earthquake. And again, it's going to be witnessed by the whole world. And now the cameras will now be trained and, and they will see all this rubble, all these destroyed buildings. And they will be training it on, on people who are buried by, by the rubble, people who are dead in the streets. Um, they will be seeing a ground that's divided, streets that are destroyed, roads that are destroyed. I tell you, it's going to be one, one uh, very shocking uh, news for, for the rest of the world. And then it says, and they gave glory to the God of heaven. And I would, I would like to assume that perhaps... This would be a time, this would be one of the times or in some of the Jews. Remember, I said one-third. And it's possible that some of the Jews, that one-third remnant that the Old Testament is talking about, would come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ because of these events. And I would also assume that not only many Jews would accept Christ as Lord during that time, I'm thinking that many people who witness these events will probably turn to the Lord. As I keep on mentioning, the greatest harvest of souls will take place in the tribulation period. So there's a, an upside to uh, the tribulation period. And then finally, and we will end with this, it says the second woe is past. Behold, the third woe is coming. And so what it's saying is that there will be no improvement in earthly conditions. There will be more and more and more calamities, more and more torments, more and more heartaches, afflictions, judgments taking place in the latter three and a half years of the tribulation period. There's more that's going to come. And so... Uh, again, that is what we see here. Uh, I will end with this. It's, I've taken up a lot of time already. And I hope that you had learned a lot. And so let me just give you a little time to compose some of your questions, if there are questions. 
and if there are no questions, I'd like to take the time to promote uh, something to you uh, later on. So I'll just give you a minute, perhaps, uh, to formulate any questions in your minds. Just put it on the chat line. I'll try to read them. And let me just see if I can answer them right now. If I cannot answer them right now, I'll, I'll probably research on that and then give you an answer next week. So let me just have a, um, grab a, my water here and uh, I'll let you uh, ask some questions on the chat line. And of course, Elaine, uh, w watching together uh, right now. Uh, of, of course, Pastor Jeffner Sapitula of Living Word Downtown, Jacinto Chu in Australia. Galvin Colliantes is watching us. Uh, Aileen uh, from Springs of Life Christian Church from Pastor Jojo Garcia's church. Uh, uh, I believe that you will be gathering already this uh, coming Sunday and Pastor Jojo, I heard, is going to preach. Um, please stay safe and uh, I pray that God will protect you uh, during your uh, congregational gathering. Uh, praise the Lord. Michael Chua says, uh, good afternoon, Pastor Mel. Good afternoon once again, Michael. Uh, nice to have you tuning in. Marisa, Mylene, uh, please greet uh, Jarwin and your daughters for me. Uh, Pastor Junji Cinco, Joy Rafals. Uh, also Luna Andrino, uh, Lilia Calcaben, uh, Remy from Hong Kong, praise the Lord. Uh, Jun Tolentino, how are you? Uh, also Sister Trixie, together with your kids, uh, it's good for you to be tuning in. Uh, also, I'd like to welcome James Humilgo, Jerry Villarin, Jerlene Villarin, I believe watching from Spain, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, Feli Castro from uh, Camp Aguinaldo, I believe. How are you? Uh, James Humilgo, uh, Vicen, uh, Vicentius Vinces, Prisco Labana, Mariter Bolo, uh, Brother uh, Bubong Poblete in Beliaba Leite. Pastor Bubong, how are you? Long time no see. Nice to have you with us. Uh, Pastor Jesse Reguero, Ruth Seno. Praise the Lord. Um, all right, Marilu Lagare, Abadet, Catherine, Julie, praise the Lord, Pastor Flora Pagikan, Sister Carol, uh, Sister Loy, Sister Miriam, DJ, Honey Lynn, says Obensa, Deborah from UK, uh, Holly from Puerto Princesa, Pastor Edgar Gapus, uh, watching us from... Um, uh, UK, of course. Brother Lester and Kathy, hi, how are you? Uh, Araceli from Cagayan de Oro, praise the Lord. All right, so we have some questions here. Um, all right, one question, I, I see it here in the chat line. Why did Enoch not experience death? Well, we are told in the scriptures that he walked with God. And of course, walking there does not speak about walking literally with God. But it simply means that he was in complete alignment with God's will. He was living a righteous and upright life. And because God was pleased with him, God decided to translate him into heaven without experiencing death. And so that is the reason that is cited uh, for us in the scriptures. But aside from that, I believe that Enoch serves as a type, together with Elijah, that the rapture is an event that we should look forward to because Enoch, in a way, was raptured. Elijah was also raptured. And then in the New Testament, it's talking about the rapture. So the question is, is there any biblical precedent of an event wherein people were translated straight into heaven? 
And so you find two very good examples. You find the example of Enoch. You find the example of Elijah being translated without experiencing death. And so you, you have a look at uh, Thessalonians and you have a look at Corinthians, which speaks about the rapture. Then you say in your mind, it's possible. There is a biblical precedent in the Old Testament showing to us that the rapture is something that is possible under God. Of course, there is nothing impossible with the Lord. So that's one question. So I'm just going through the chat line right now. I'd also like to greet Brother Arnel and Sister Lani Aragon of our church in UK, Rosa Vistal, uh, also Shawnee de Guzman, of course, our uh, Prayer Mountain uh, head, uh, Arceleta from California, USA, uh, Janine Regalia, also Rosemary, Maria Fe. All right, here we have a question from Nicole, Nicole Calderon. All right, let me see what the question is. My question is, in the book of 1 Samuel 16, 14 to 16, it talks about the evil spirit of God. How do you explain to us this evil, what this evil spirit means? Thank you, and God bless you. So let me just go to 1 Samuel chapter 16. like you to flip your Bibles as well just so that uh, you can study together with me so this is an online uh, Bible study remember it's a table talk so you are able to talk to me through the chat line I'm able to converse with you as I read your chat line so first Samuel let me just see um, first Samuel 16 14 to 16 it says now the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord terrorized him. Saul's servants then said to him, Behold now, an evil spirit from God is ter terrorizing you. Now first of all, let's talk about uh, it from a negative standpoint. Here's the negative standpoint. When it says an evil spirit from the Lord, terrorized uh, King Saul, first of all, it does not mean that God is evil. All right? It does not mean that God is evil or that God could be tempted. The Bible is very clear in James chapter 1 that our God is a holy God and that He does not tempt anyone. Having said that, maybe I can lend a little light here at least in my understanding of scripture when you go into the lord's prayer it says um, lead us not into temptation and so you wonder if god does not tempt us why is it that the bible says or why is it that jesus tells us to pray lead us not into temptation and I think a partial explanation of that is given to us in Romans chapter 1. And, and so I'd like to go to Romans chapter 1 at this time. And again, this is just a partial explanation. Uh, Romans chapter 1 reads, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness because that which is known about God is evident within them for God made it evident to them for since the creation of the world his invisible attributes his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen being understood through what has been made so that they are without excuse. For even though they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their speculations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man and of birds and four-footed animals and crawling creatures. Now, 
So, uh, verses 18 to 23 talks about the wrath of God coming upon man because man does not recognize the invisible attributes of God. And not only that, they create God in their own image by creating images uh, made of wood and stone with the form of corruptible man, birds, four-footed animals, and crawling creatures. Now, I'd like you to watch what the next verse says. Verse 24 now says, Therefore, God gave them over in their hearts, uh, in the lusts of their hearts, to impurity, so that their bodies would be dishonored among them. For they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worship and serve the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. In other words, after the attributes of God are known and after God has declared himself clearly to mankind and yet mankind continues to reject him and rebels against him, the Bible says God gives him over. God gives him over. In other words, God abandons him to his own lusts. And I think this is somewhat similar to what happened in the case of King Saul. King Saul was stubborn. King Saul was hard-headed. King Saul was disobedient in spite of the fact that the prophet Samuel was guiding, counseling, mentoring, rebuking him. He still kept on doing the wrong things. So God gives him over to this evil spirit, all right? That's what it means that an evil spirit from God speaking basically of the sovereignty of God, the rulership of God. Here's something we need to understand. Everything is under the rulership of God, including evil spirits, including Satan himself. That is why if you go to the book of Job, didn't you notice Satan even had to ask permission from God to be able to do the things that he did against Job. So what does that tell you? The sovereignty of God. We are not to imagine that God only rules and reigns upon his heavenly angels. God rules and reigns even upon Satan and his cohorts. The rulership of God extends to every part of God's creation. Now, that doesn't mean that all of God's creation is uh, revering him or respecting him or worshiping him. No, that's not what I mean. It only means that they can only move within the caveat or the boundary that God would allow them. So that's something that um, I hope uh, gives a little uh, clarity to your question. So let me just see if there are more questions in the chat line. I'd like to welcome uh, Cherila Spini from Hawaii. Also, thank you, Jerry Lopez, who is watching from Kuwait. Praise the Lord. Um, thank you for joining us. Nelita from Paranaque. Praise God. Sister Gloria Dawson is watching with us. Uh, I hope uh, Brother John is all right. Uh, we prayed for him and uh, we've been continually praying for him and uh, hopefully he's getting better. He's in the hospital right now. Please remember John Dawson in prayer, please. Edita from uh, Desmarinas, Cavite. Senaida, Sister Vivian Baisak. Uh, Virgie Garlitos, of course, our deaconess. Eka Ramil. Lourdes Lou from New Jersey, how are you? Um, Ronaline. Praise the Lord. Uh, well, sir, we have Sister Mayet from Bulgaria. Praise the Lord. First time, I think, uh, we've had somebody from Bulgaria. Welcome to our program. Nonai Gileta from Italy. Praise the Lord. Thank you for viewing our program from Italy. John Tes Kusai from UK. Talia Jenks from UK. How are you? Um, Fritzi from Pardo. Uh, Thomas Diaz. Here's another question. What does it say? What do you mean by global, global lit caval? The spelling is C A V A L. Are they really antichrist? 
Um, I don't remember me mentioning something like globalit kabal. You may have just misheard me or um, I don't know what, what happened here. Uh, but I did not mention anything like globalit kabal. So maybe you can rephrase your question and let me see if uh, I can answer that. Uh, so I just continue to greet Sonia D, Felix, Tenelin, Samuel Sia watching from Makati. Hi, Brother Sami, how are you? I used to be my uh, next door neighbor. Um, uh, all right, we have Alma from Palo Leyte. We have, all right, Edita Laureano. Question is, who is. Who are the two witnesses in the time of the tribulation period? I, I think I already answered that question. We do not know their names. Uh, they will be raised up in the tribulation period. But most definitely, I do not believe that they referred to Moses and Elijah, nor Enoch, nor John the Baptist. I don't think it refers to them. Sister Vicky, how are you? Uh, here's another question. Uh, did the Antichrist pan this coronavirus 19? Um, for the Antichrist to fund the coronavirus, he will have to be present already in our midst. And I don't think he is present uh, in our midst right now. Probably he, he might be a baby, I don't know. Uh, or he might be a young boy, we don't know. But again, uh, this is pure speculation. So, no, I, I don't think uh, we can answer that, that question. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, what I mean is definitely it could not have been funded by the Antichrist. Uh, Christine Ligtas is watching us. Um, praise the Lord. And uh, Brother Ramon from Talamban, Iris, also is watching us. So. Praise the Lord. Thank you so much. I think that would be all for today. Oh, allow me to just promote uh, some uh, very important announcements. So I hope uh, please continue to stay with me before I um, say goodbye to you. Uh, first of all, I'd like to invite you this coming Saturday at 10 o'clock in the morning. I have been invited by uh, World Vision to do a talk on... Um, discipleship and um, this is going to be viewed through zoom and this is going to be nationwide so i'd like you to uh, please log in to the page of world vision there is a free registration if you would like to join me this coming saturday and by the way the following saturday my son aj was also invited by uh, world vision so hopefully you can uh, keep us company as the entire country will be watching us. Uh, hopefully there will be other people also from other countries who will be viewing us as well. So please do not forget this coming Saturday, World Vision, I will be talking about discipleship. Uh, also, I'd like to announce that my book has been printed, hallelujah, more than enough, uh, has, uh, has been fully printed already and ready to be delivered uh, our people from omf are just waiting for the go signal uh, for them to be able to ship the materials to us and i already gave them the go signal but of course uh, we are still in quarantine so we don't know when it will be shipped to us but it's already there it's been printed already i'm excited to have a hardbound copy of it and so again we continue to offer you the pre-selling price of 300 pesos the pre-selling price of 300 pesos the regular retail price when it arrives is going to be 350 pesos so uh, please um, get in touch with um, my uh, communications officer uh, sister karen and gracia um, i think we flash the number on the screen every uh, every sunday so please get in touch and make your necessary payments so that you can save 50 pesos because the regular price would be, um, again, uh, it would be uh, 
350. And also, please do not forget our live intercession uh, this coming Friday. Uh, so many things to pray for. I think this coming Friday, are we July 31? Or are we already in August? Uh, I'm not sure. I don't have a calendar here. Um, but again, supposedly, the uh, ECQ should be up until July, at uh, the end of July. So, um, it would be a good time for us to pray. Uh, there are so many things to really pray about. There are cities in our country that are uh, having another surge of coronavirus. Manila is one. Uh, for the past three days, they've been having 2,000 uh, infections or contaminations every uh, single day. That's huge. And, and that is why uh, right now, Metro Manila in a, is in a far uh, worse situation than we are uh, here in Cebu. Um, again, we still need to pray for Cebu. And also, um, please do not forget this coming Sunday, uh, I'll be... Uh, talking about part two of my sermon which I began last um, last Sunday and also please do not forget prepare your hearts we're going to have communion so please do not forget so shall we end in prayer please my my dear brothers and sisters let's pray right now Heavenly Father we just thank you and praise you for today uh, thank you for a very fruitful time of uh, Bible study and we look forward to studying more of your word and uh, Lord, we pray you bless your people. I pray those who still do not have a relationship with you might come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Lord, thank you for this time. We give you back the glory, praise, and thanks. Again, we'd like you to like and share the video. We want to spread the word around. Kindly put it on Viber and Messenger and also put it on your Facebook wall. Tag as many people as you can. And so my team, my wife Marie and my son AJ would like to say hi and goodbye. We'll see you next time. We are now signing off. God bless you.